want to welcome everyone uh, to the, today's talk. My name is Lisa Stewart. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at the Cavalli Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, California. It's my honor to welcome you on behalf of the KITP today for a talk by Dr. Richard Anantua um, for the National Society of Black Physicists Innovate Seminar Series. This is the 11th talk in the series. Um, all of the prior talk recordings are posted both on the NSVP and KITP websites, where this one will also appear within about a day. Today's talk will be approximately 30 minutes, followed by Q&A at the very end. So as questions arise for you throughout the talk, please go ahead and enter those into the Q&A section, um, and those will be moderated at the end. So I do have two very quick announcements, and I'm going to drop links for both of these into the chat. First of all, I understand today is the deadline for registering for the 2021 NSBP conference, um, which is the first week of November. So register for that if you haven't done so already. That conference is a remarkable annual event and you do not want to miss it. So please do that. Um, and then secondly, I'd like to just mention if any of the faculty who are in today's audience for the call, please take a look at the second link for the KITP Fellows Program, which is a fellowship that supports faculty in physics or astronomy at minority serving institutions for a long visit to KITP up to eight weeks in 2022-2023. The application for that is about three weeks out, November the 15th. Now I'm going to pass it over to Farah Simpson, the leader of NSBP Student Council, which is the group responsible for creating and leading the Innovate Seminar Series. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy today's talk. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to the NSBP Innovate Seminar Series. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am a part of the Student Council, the leader of the Student Council and Student Representative, and we came together with NSBP's board to create this forum for NSBP members to share their research ideas and the groundbreaking research that they're involved in, um, in a non-specialist way to a general audience. And so, as Lisa said, this is a 30-minute talk followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Thank you so much for joining us. And as this seminar grows, um, please continue to support us and attend these talks to hear the amazing research that our members are involved in. Um, I'd like to now present the president of the National Society of Black Physicists, who will present our speaker today, Dr. Stefan Alexander. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, if you hear some background noise, it's because I'm in New York City right now to celebrate the 60th anniversary of my mentor, David Spurgel. Um, so I'm here. I just jumped in with a couple of days of great celebration for a great scientist and a big time support of NSVP, by the way. Um, so anyway, um, for those of you who don't know, David Spurgel is a great astrophysicist and now the president of the Simons Foundation. It is a great pleasure to introduce one of our young superstars um, of NSVP, um, Richard, Dr. Richard Anantua, who hails now as a postdoc at a multi-institutional um, appointment at Harvard University. Um, Richard hails from New York City like myself and um, grew, um, did his undergraduate at Yale and then his PhD at Stanford University, I think with, Ro with Robert Blan um, Roger Blanford. And, um, and what more do I have to say about Richard? Um, he is also a great athlete, actually, um, great, um, unlike me. Um, <laughs> and a, just a great guy, a brilliant, a brilliant um, physicist and pedagogue. And let me see, uh, one more thing I wanted to say, that's right. So I wanna now, I wanna also thank the leadership um, of Student Council, um, Nico, Cooper, and Farah for making this all possible with the support of KITP. I had a great meeting with the director of the KIT, KITP the other day. And I know that we're gonna be expanding this effort to bring the NSVP Innovate Seminar Series to the world. And I'm very excited about the next developments to come. And on that note, Dr. Richard Anantua. Thank you, uh, Stefan. And we all envy to be in your position with all the great leadership you've demonstrated. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Farah. Thank you, everyone at KITP and, and whoever's watching. And um, 
I'm Richard Arantua. I hail from the institutions that uh, uh, Stefan just mentioned. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be giving a glimpse into event horizon scale physics uh, from movies and polarization maps. And uh, when we talk about event horizons, that gives us uh, some inkling into the type of physics we're uh, referring to, and it's going to involve re general relativity. And uh, some of the reasons that I love giving talks about relativity include uh, when I'm given a time limit, uh, like 30 minutes, I can ask in whose reference frame, and then I can excuse myself if I uh, go a little bit over. So on that note, I'm going to start with an outline of the talk. And it's going to begin with a brief introduction to relativity. And it's going to start in a somewhat uh, counterintuitive place uh, in electromagnetism. But it's going to then go on to what we traditionally associate with uh, relativity and uh, special relativity and general relativity. And I'm going to be then uh, showing how my own research uh, relates to this in the observing jet accretion flow black hole systems paradigm, which I'm going to start out uh, in an introductory and pedagogical manner with uh, terminology and definitions. I'm going to continue with the application of M87, and uh, we're going to be observing JAB simulations or jet equation flow black hole simulations of M87, and in particular, comparing them uh, with images at uh, 43 gigahertz scales in Event Horizon Telescope or 230 gigahertz scales. And we're also going to be thinking, time permitting, about future horizons. So Sagittarius A star, uh, rumor has it, is a black hole at the center of our galaxy. And uh, we're going to be observing JAB simulations of Sagittarius A star and comparing it with some uh, old EHT constraints. And uh, we're even going to see movies in uh, model parameter space. So I want to take a little detour into the relationships between electric and magnetic fields. And we're going to be starting out with Maxwell's equations. So um, we can start by thinking of sources that produce electric and magnetic fields and uh, what phenomena are related to this. So first we have, uh, and I want you to start looking at the right-hand side first uh, in what's to follow. First, uh, we have uh, charge densities uh, like rho produce diverging electric fields. However, we don't have any monopole-like divergences that we've discovered so far for magnetic fields. Uh, and we also have a source of a changing magnetic field that relates to an electric field with a curl. And notice a minus sign. So it seems that this electric field arises to resist this uh, change of magnetic field. And we also have uh, our last of Maxwell's equations, uh, which uh, shows us that uh, current uh, or vo uh, a volume current J and some other term, which we might associate with something else a little later, is associated to a magnetic field with a cur curl. So we also note that uh, in order to get dynamics, we should be thinking about forces. And some of us remember from physics class our right-hand rule. So if you put your first finger along a vector like V, your other fingers along a vector like B, out of my palm and into the page will be a magnetic force that acts on a positive charge. And that's uh, the Lorentz force law. So along with Maxwell's equations, we basically have a handle on uh, the relationships between electric and magnetic fields. So let there be light. So uh, in that case, I'm talking about a pointing flux. So imagine uh, electric and magnetic fields propagating uh, orthogonal to each other. And transversely, as a pointing flux propagates. So knowing something about uh, uh, electric and magnetic fields, we can also recast these in integral form. So uh, we can think of uh, the uh, diverging uh, electric fields as uh, uh, the fodder for being integrated over surfaces. So what comes through the surface is basically what charges were inside. We also have a, a trivial um, version of Gauss's law for magnetism. And we note that uh, 
the uh, Faraday law can now be thought of as line integrals of uh, electric fields on the boundary. Uh, and that corresponds to the changing magnetic flux through a surface. And now we can also look at uh, Ampere's law. So uh, an enclosed uh, current uh, sources a uh, magnetic field with a curl uh, that you can have a line integral around the boundary, but it also has a term that can be thought of as a displacement current. So we have another current here in uh, Ampere's law. So now that we have the uh, fundamental equations of the dynamics of electromagnetism, we now think of another theory that uh, uh, we should be a little bit familiar with, and this is special relativity. And and the electrodynamics of moving bodies, this uh, book tied together electric and magnetic phenomena to relativity. So Einstein, uh, in some thought experiments, established that relative and not absolute motion establishes current in a magnet conductor system. And simultaneity, uh, going through these thought experiments, uh, uh, depends on the observer's state of motion or reference frame. And he even had a definition for what it means to synchronize uh, in a frame. So this is when time differences, uh, when you're measured near whatever event you're talking about, uh, from when light is emitted uh, at A to when it's received as B, uh, at B, if that equals the time that it takes for the reverse journey, then clocks are synchronized. So armed with this, let's go through some of the thought experiments uh, that uh, led Einstein to conceive of relativity. So as a conductor, this uh, gray metallic object, uh, we can imagine what happens according to the Maxwell's equations that we discussed when you have a source that tries to jam magnetic flux through this surface. So we know from the uh, Maxwell's uh, equations, uh, in, in this case, the one for Faraday's law, that you can uh, induce based on the changing magnetic flux that's going through here, through this conductor, because you're in this, conduct or this rest frame, uh, you can induce uh, electric field that gives you a current through this conductor based on the way these magnetic fields are changing through this, air, uh, through this uh, region. Now, imagine, if you are doing the same thing, only you're in the frame of the magnet. So uh, this magnet is uh, stationary, but now you are uh, having a moving conductor, moving in the opposite sense that uh, is, is exposed to this um, magnet. So in this case, um, as any self-respecting magnet will tell you, the forces are now due to the magnetic field on moving charges. So the Lorentz force law now gives you a current. And if we notice what happened before, it's exactly the same current. So it seems that the current that was established by the electric field in the first case is depending on the state of, relative, of, of motion, the uh, same current that is established by the magnetic field. So Einstein's thought experiment here tells us that electricity and magnetism may be two sides of the same coin. So uh, in the spirit of uh, relativity, we have a number of postulates. So the laws by which the physical states of system can undergo change are not affected, whether these changes of state refer to the one or the other of two systems of coordinates in which uniform transitory motion occurs. So the laws of physics are the same in any two inertial reference frames, and we'll go through this a little bit more. And we have another postulate of relativity. So I promise the list isn't that long. Uh, any uh, ray of light basically moves at the speed of light in a vacuum. So, and this is a, a pretty appreciable speed. Light would go around the uh, circumference of the earth uh, seven or eight times in a second. So it, it's, it's a very, very uh, um, high speed, but it's not infinite and that's important. So just based on these two postulates, we have relativity. And the setting in which we can conceive of this relativity occurring are uh, at least in the case of special relativity, which we start out with our inertial reference frames, which move relative to each other at what we call a boost of a constant velocity. So um, here is uh, the frame S prime being boosted relative to S. And this boost ends up mixing up 
all of these coordinates uh, in terms of the unboosted coordinates that we started out with. So the frame S, which is boosted here with this velocity that's just in the uh, X direction uh, with respect to S, has now an origin that is moving relative to the uh, origin of the rest frame. And the vectors like R in S are going to be boosted according to transformations that we call Lorentz transformations into these vectors R prime and S prime. Now that we have the arena set up, let's see what we can do with it. So uh, another thought experiment one can do is imagine a very, very fundamental clock that works by registering ticks by having light go between two mirrors. So first do this in S. When we do this experiment in the frame S, we can see the round trip only takes delta T equals 2H over C. But we remember that uh, the second postulate of relativity tells us the speed of light, uh, and pretend this is moving in a vacuum, is uh, the same in all these reference frames. So if we were to do the same ticking in frame S prime, we get a longer path length, and thus we get a dilated time measured by that clock. And all the experiments that, can, that one can do in the frame uh, S prime are going to lead to the fact that these light clocks agree with ordinary watches or other devices uh, that we now are led to at a conclusion that time actually is subject to this dilation by this Lorentz factor gamma when it's subjected to Lorentz transformations. And we can perform a similar thought experiment now with the light clock turned uh, 90 degrees so that the light is moving parallel to the motion of the clock. And we can calculate the time it takes for this round trip to occur. So we do it from event A to event B which is the light going to the mirror that's uh, going in the same direction. And then we do this from event B to event C where the light is returning and the uh, mirror C is approaching it. And we can measure the tick of a light clock, this time uh, being translated uh, in a direction that's, uh, um, that, that's perpendicular to its height. Sorry, that's parallel to its height. And when we do that, we get using some algebra that uh, the time is elapsed uh, in a way that uh, delta T prime is equal to L prime over C times two gamma squared. But if we compare this to what we know to be the, uh, the time dilated uh, time from our previous example, we can compare formulas and see that the length actually is contracted. And this is telling us that uh, now space and time are completely dependent on your state of motion in relativity. So we can also conceive of uh, a new uh, branch of uh, unification that goes beyond just those inertial frames. So uh, when Einstein uh, starts to extend his theory of special relativity, he had to consider things like gravitational fields. So these things are strong near black holes, neutron stars, uh, to now have uh, potential consequences for the way we measure lens, times, frequencies, energies, et cetera. So uh, in a 1915 lecture at the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin, Einstein uh, introduced his theory of general relativity, which we will hear about now. In 1905, Einstein published his theory of special relativity, which explored the link between space and time. In Einstein's view, there isn't really a separate thing. There's space and then there's time. But there's just one thing, space-time, that we all live in. He thought of this new space-time as a fabric weaving together space and time. In 1950, Einstein developed his theory of general relativity, which modified special relativity to include gravity and its effects on this fabric of space-time. Welcome to the bouncy trampoline of gravity. 
We've taken our fabric of space-time, stretched it taut, and placed a heavy weight on it. See how it warps the fabric of space-time. the fabric, it magically seems to be drawn or attracted to the massive weight at the center. All right. So we have some idea of what's going on here, but let's think about how this unification was achieved. And now we have some more thought experiments. So consider uh, two labs in which two independent researchers are performing experiments. Now, Think about what experiment might be able to distinguish uh, between what's going on in the outside of Gravilab versus Acklab. So, you know, these, these names are uh, suggestive. So think of Gravilab being near a strong gravitating body like that black hole and Acklab, which from our perspective, we know is, is near this, this accelerating piston. So, if we've ever been in an elevator, you know, it's a, we always wonder whether it's a black hole that's right underneath our feet or a cable system, but no, don't, don't really use any knowledge from what you might've had walking into these labs. Just think about from within these labs, what experiment could you possibly be doing? And feel free to put some things in the comments or just to follow along a little bit. And something that one could potentially measure is the tidal force. So the tidal force is a consequence of being near a gravitational force profile. And this is unique to uh, Gravilab where the existence of the gravitational field throughout this region would actually give differential forces tugging on this person's feet versus head that wouldn't exist in ACLAB. So that would happen and that would be a way to distinguish unless the labs are very, very small, in which case Einstein had the insight that there actually is no experiment locally that could distinguish between Gravilab and Acklab if we are talking about a region that is, is small enough. So uh, the local properties of curved space-time are indistinguishable from those of flat space-time, and that's the equivalence principle. So to see if we've uh, noted some of the things from before and feel free to put your, your answers in the uh, comments or in the chat section. So we've talked about synchronization before. So imagine if uh, this person in the spaceship synchronized that person's clocks in a way that's sensible to those inhabiting the spaceship, but we're in a world that's governed by uh, special relativity in this little review. Now, what, source would an observer outside that spaceship, thinking that this, this spaceship is moving at velocity v, think would reach the uh, eyes of this person first. So source A, source B, or source is A and B at the same time. So if we think a, a little bit, source B, which is that source whose light beams are approaching the uh, what we think is a moving observer uh, is, is actually going to be uh, appearing to interact with the observer before a source A. And this is, this is uh, odd because we thought that we synchronized this, but it turns out that relativity actually has very profound implications for even the procedures that this person could have done to synchronize the clocks in the first place. So we don't even agree with whether that person really synchronized those clocks. So we have relativity of simultaneity. So, we have a very uh, fundamentally unique world of uh, relativity that challenges what we thought of as uh, initially uh, absolute quantities like space, time, electric, and magnetic fields. But now the objects that we're going to be working with here even put those objects uh, to shame in a, in a way. So we can think about uh, objects that have such strong gravity 
like can't escape them. And this idea goes back at least to John Mitchell in 1783, but this is not a uh, idea that's unique to Einstein, but that uh, um, gravitating bodies uh, have escape speeds. And these uh, ideas uh, actually had a very, very handy uh, uh, solution in the solution that Carl Schwarzschild devised in 1916 for a spherically symmetric and uh, non-rotating mass. And these solutions were generalized uh, by Roy Kerr in 1963. And we have uh, pioneers that start to couple quantum mechanics with gravity in the 1970s, like Stephen Hawking. So black holes have a very uh, fundamental and central part in uh, fund central part in, in the in theoretical physics and modern physics. And uh, now we are going to see uh, some of what black holes can be uh, conceived of as doing in their uh, actual setting because these objects actually have been observed. So can gravity warp space-time is, and this answer is yes, objects can change the space-time distance formula, you can think of a line element in space-time changing in response to the presence of gravitating objects or fields, or, or, or you can think of, of uh, a relationship between geometry and the matter and content in space-time. And in strong gravity, we even have space-times that are warped to an extent where the geometry is like a throat and it ends up at a singularity. So these gravity, these uh, black holes are very extreme objects that make them good testing grounds for uh, some of the physics that we know. So we'll do another thought experiment. So briefly, uh, if we know from our classical mechanics uh, classes that uh, massive objects have escape speed where the potential energy of the gravitating object is uh, um, equal to the um, kinetic energy at the escape speed, uh, then we note that so we can compute an escape speed for these objects. So if we just apply that naive intuition, we can actually derive something about black holes. And uh, um, in this uh, case, the, you know, we, we note that uh, it's pretty independent of the test mass that's being launched from that larger mass. Uh, so we can even uh, do uh, exercise that allows us to set the escape speed to the speed of light. And by definition, we would have uh, a horizon. And uh, in this case, uh, light is actually trapped between here. And this condition actually gives you the condition for the Schrodinger radius of a black hole. And note that this is linear in the mass. So we have the Schrodinger uh, radius, which is twice a gravitational radius. And uh, these quantities actually are useful for describing both the length, the, uh, the mass, and, and time scales of black holes. So now I will go into some of my applications of this. So I work in the world of general relativistic magnetodynamic simulations, which means that uh, I need acronyms for what I do. So I have observing jet or accretion flow black hole systems. And when we have the simulations, we can convert what the variables are when we treat astrophysical plasmas or fluids into prescriptions for emission, absorption, polarization. The things that we can actually see are not uniquely mapped onto a particular plasma flow that we can solve for in the simulation. So that's why we need step two. And we can also observe these uh, sources or observe the simulations. So we can do this for sources like M87, which actually was observed in polarized light by the Event Horizon Telescope. And we can start to do this for Sagittarius A star, though no observation has been officially released yet. And I will be talking about these applications in what follows. But first, let's just go through some of the astrophysical terminology and definitions. An active galactic nucleus is a compact emitting region uh, around the central massive object. Uh, and it appears as a discrete source. 
an accretion disk is an inflowing and typically magnetized plasma that's bound to the central object, as in that cartoon. They can be magnetically arrested as we're finding from the simulations where the magnetic pressure actually inhibits them from falling in. And they can also uh, have standard and normal evolution, which is of course SANE, so more acronyms. Uh, and we also know that light can be decomposed by its uh, structure into different polarization directions. So remember that those electric and magnetic fields propagating, they form these pointing flux uh, of rays of light and they have independent linear polarizations, Q and U, and circular polarization, which is the remaining polarized light. A relativistic jet is a polarized outflow that, uh, sorry, it's a polar outflow. It, it happens to be polarized in the jets that I look at as well, like M87, but it's a polar outflow emanating from rotating black holes in about 10% of AGN. And Blanford Nyack jets uh, are powered by the interplay of black hole spin and um, uh, the magnetic field uh, that forms vertical flux patches falling in. So you can actually form a jet if you actually know that um, the black holes actually drag the space time around them, including the fields to power up these uh, lines of uh, magnetic energy. And synchrotron radiation is polarized radiation that occurs when particles gyrate around these field lines. So we have our first observations of black holes from the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a network of telescopes placed all around the Earth. And uh, these telescopes are sensitive to those 230 gigahertz radio frequencies. And the reason why these baselines of telescopes or pairs of telescopes around the world need to be so long is that the ability to distinguish between two sources in the sky depends on the angular separation as follows. So the minimum angular scale you can recover is like the wavelength of light. Here it's about a millimeter over the aperture size. So the features that we need in order to see black hole gravitational radii or a few factor or a factor of a few beyond that correspond in the case of M87 to the resolution you would need to see a credit card on the moon or uh, in order to read a uh, piece of text from uh, one coast of the US to the other. So it's an extremely exquisite amount of resolution that we need to do this. So that's why it took so long. And now that we have the first image, we have one in polarized light. So here is actually what it's like to zoom into the galactic center so the constellation Virgo is at 12 hours right ascension and uh, 13 degrees definition, and it houses the uh, best studied cluster of galaxies to us. It, in fact, the supermassive black hole with the uh, second largest angular width on the sky is in a Virgo cluster galaxy known as M87. This M87 galaxy uh, is has this relative to jet, which she referred to as called a curious straight ray because of its 100 kiloparsec emission remaining jet. And the Event Horizon Telescope has seen it all the way down to the horizon scale. And in order to understand what's going on, a theorist like me puts in guesses for what's heating the electrons in these blobs of uh, emission that we see. So in order to understand what's causing these plasmas to light up to billions of degrees, we need to invoke some astrophysical mechanisms like turbulent heating. So these plasmas are roughly collisionless, but uh, they're also quite turbulent. And they can be described as two independent temperatures for the protons and electrons, where the uh, proton uh, temperature in a turbulent heating model that I call the critical beta model can uh, fall exponentially in the plasma beta uh, where beta is the gas pressure over the magnetic pressure. There are alternate ways to relate the temperatures of ions and electrons in these plasmas to plasma quantities like beta, which is, for instance, the R high, R low uh, parametric model or the R beta model of the Event Horizon Telescope uh, co uh, collaboration papers, one through eight. We can also conceive of different physics that could give us different ways of uh, heating or even equivalently because P 
PE equals rho TE pressurizing the emitting particles. So we can conceive of one where the pressure of relativistic electrons is a constant uh, fraction of the magnetic pressure. And we note that in this type of model, the uh, kinetic energy of the particles is equal proportion with the magnetic energy when beta E naught is about one. And we can also generalize that constant beta E model so that the uh, pressure of the relativistic emitter is those like powers of the magnetic pressure. And when we do that, we can actually start putting in some of these prescriptions to light up different simulations. So to tie this with relativity, we have observations in M87 of the images having features that appear to move several times the speed of light in the observing plane. Now, we remember Einstein's postulates, so we might wonder why is this the case? Why can we have these images that we reliably track uh, blobs from that by all the indications have blobs that are moving several times the speed of light in, in those image planes. Well, think about the projection and the finite speed of light. So if you have a blob that is stationary and it's emitting, then uh, you have the light travel time from the blob to you that determines when you get the light. But if the blob is approaching you, it's approaching you in, in an oblique way the light travel time difference between uh, when the blob was here and when the blob was there can actually be computed in a way that gives you the apparent motion of the blob in the plane of the observer that is potentially greatly, greatly increased uh, by factors that depend on the ratio of the speed of the blob to the speed of light. And also the angle, so the closer the angle and the closer this is the speed of light, could actually reach uh, very, very relativistic speeds. And we try to do this in our simulations. So we can start to emulate some of these properties using our simulations in that magnetic bias model with n equals zero. We can also tie in other phenomenologies by relating the pressure of the emitting electrons to the uh, plasma quantities, like the current densities that are going through them. So this current density model has the pressure of the emitters going like the current density. And the model being at left, one sees that uh, there are flailing sheets of return current around an outgoing current that is fairly st stable in the spine. But not one of our most salient uh, features, and uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, wrap up ME7 pretty soon. One of our most salient, salient features in the observations is that we have limb brighten structures at uh, the boundaries. So we can compare some of these limb brighten features to the uh, uh, model. and we also can compare polarized observations with uh, models that include other species of part particles, including positrons. So this highlights the dichotomy between magnetically arrested disk and standard normal evolution. The degree of polarization in this magnetically arrested disk actually has a rough cancellation of uh, uh, any effect that's not intrinsic circular polarization. So the circular polarization goes down linearly when we add pairs up to an amount equivalent to the original number density of electrons. So these pairs of electrons and positrons actually uh, add completely different emitting properties than just the electron proton plasma that they started with. And this is actually very different from what happens when we do this in a standard normal evolution simulation. So with this simulation, there are large parity effects that actually convert polarizations to each other and rotate uh, um, polarizations. So we actually have a pattern of electric vector polarization angles that rotate uh, that tell you that the orientation of the polarization depends very sensitively on the positron fraction in the same case. So we can also now think about other black holes. So, you know, if we remember our popular science and, uh, you know, in five minutes, I'll go over a Sagittarius star. We note that uh, we had photon rings in the movie Interstellar that looked very exquisite, but something's missing if we remember about relativity. And relativity, we have relativistic beaming, and this would, should actually light up one of these sides of the rotating accretion flow than the other, assuming this black hole is rotating, which you know, if we see the movie, these flows do appear to rotate. So we can zoom into our own galactic center, and then the question that we would have to ask is what happens at the center? There could be blobs nearby the galactic center that we've seen in the infrared through the gravity collaboration, but I'm gonna also talk about what happens here very briefly. The Event Horizon Telescope has constraints on the characteristic emitting region size at the galactic center source. 
And these constraints are for an isotropic estimate of uh, a you know, circular Gaussian of uh, 37 micro arc seconds, but the real answer is a non-point symmetric uh, elliptical Gaussian or something that's better approximate an elliptical Gaussian with the 56 micro arc seconds full with half max. And the analysis in Sagittarius A star shows that when we compare our model parameter space with the allowed sizes by the Event Horizon Telescope, we can actually exclude some of our models, but we also have degeneracies in some of our models where we can have the compact asymmetric shape replicated and the limits of high F and beta crit and low constant beta E. So we can even classify the models that we saw and they form four types. Uh, so they form a thin compact asymmetric boson crescent with a roughly decently fitting spectrum, but they can also form in uh, other parts of parameter space, a steep uh, uh, or, or then observed spectrum and a uh, roughly coronal uh, disk jet interface boundary projection. They also have uh, morphologies where you have a uh, lens profile of disk emission. Uh, and you also have morphologies in the low end uh, bias models where you have an extended alpha emission. So these models basically fluctuate around these time averages and we can distinguish the best ones using the existing constraints. And I will leave you with my conclusions and questions. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, so now to, I guess, introduce myself and not to leave everyone in the dark. Um, I'm Nico Cooper. I'm uh, one of the members of the NSVP Student Council and one of the people um, organizing the, the Innovate Seminar Series. Um, so to stall for time a little bit for people to uh, have a chance to think about questions that they can put uh, in the chat so you can answer, I'll ask a question of my own, which is in these simulations and observations um, with magnetohydrodynamics and, and uh, accretion disks, are there any sort of signatures uh, that the Event Horizon Telescope can look for uh, that you know signal properties of the black hole itself rather than properties of the surrounding matter? Yeah, there have been a number of Event Horizon Telescope papers on the distance between photon rings that actually have implications for whether the metric around these black holes is indeed Kerr. So there have been tests of GR that actually constrain if, if so some of us in some technical language may be familiar with parametrized post-Newtonian uh, um, ways of deviating from what it means to be uh, in the Kerr metric. And there have been tests of some of these PPN uh, parameters that have excluded uh, deviations from Kerr to limits that are hundreds of times better than previous ones. And we can do that by looking at uh, the uh, size of the shadow uh, and knowing what we know in astrophysics about how rapidly these black holes are rotating, different shadow sizes predict different things for deviating from Kerr. There have even been papers on charges of black holes by the Event Horizon Telescope that actually constrains the charges of black hole. Uh, so you can think of riser, Nordenstorm black holes and deviations from, from that. So the Event Horizon Telescope is a really powerful tool and not just from the sizes that we can measure, but also the rings of emission can actually tell us uh, how the background space time is really warping uh, uh, around the black hole. Thank you so much. So Thank we you. do have uh, at least one question in the chat um, from Jeffrey Tate, uh, which is what is the significance of the 230 gigahertz and 43 gigahertz frequencies? What, yeah. drives, what drives that choice? Uh, and is it needed to visualize specific particle motion effects? Absolutely, yes, great question. So in radio astronomy, it's a lot easier to observe a jet on uh, larger scales. So, you know, think of that uh, angular resolution limit. Think of, uh, you know, how much, uh, and, and also uh, think about uh, how when you have uh, these, these larger scale observations, you need less resolution. So we started out with uh, zeroing in on the M87 black hole. So we, we did this all the way back in the time of, uh, you know, Heber Curtis uh, discovered uh, M87 when it looked like this. So 
he the first thing he noticed in the galaxy in the very least resolved images was this so-called curious straight ray in 1918. And the observations have just gotten better and closer and closer. And in radio astronomy, this is basically the closest you can get to the black hole in M87. And this took observing M87 at increasing and increasing frequency. And when you have this increasing and increasing frequency, you have uh, resolution down to smaller and smaller scales, and you also have plasma becoming more and more optically thin so that the intervening material becomes less relevant. So you see different features on these different scales, and radio astronomy is all about trying to get uh, better and better resolution. Cool. Thank you so much. Oh, and we, uh, let's see, I think we'll do um, uh, Elon next, and then the second question after that. Uh, if Elon. Hello, can you guys uh, hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, we can. Hey, Richard. Um, good to see you. Thanks for your talk today. Uh, I just wanted to ask a more general question, or, or I wanted you to elaborate a little more on the particles that you talked about, positron particle populations. Mm -hmm. Are there other populations that you put in your models? What is the purpose of that? And how does that affect the observations of the Event Horizon Telescope? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I was over at the Center for Computational Astrophysics with uh, Stefan Alexander and David Spergel thinking about what would happen if we put axions in the mix here. So. Axions, um, uh, there's a paper by, by Kim 2020 et al. Uh, that uh, showed that, uh, you know, you can have axion fields that uh, uh, are due to a phenomenon known, of, known as super radiant production that are, are resonant with the size and the uh, spin of these black holes. And these would characteristically warp uh, these patterns of polarization because the axions actually would couple with the electromagnetic fields around these black holes. However, the research into positrons shows that there are important confounds in that changing positron fraction can actually cause significant rotation, even if we're changing these positron fractions just by a few percent. So over the observing times, which are days, or we're trying to get even longer observing times, we may actually be at the point where there's some degeneracy between what is the uh, positron induced uh, uh, change in, in the dynamics of these images versus uh, what we can possibly uh, look for in axion signals. Oh, thanks for that answer. That's great. So is there anything else? Uh, also, is there anything else besides axions? Oh, well, then you'd have to get to you know, particle theorists who know a lot more about this stuff than I do, but there are probably like light scalar fields around these. Maybe even Nico would, would be able to tell us about what, what to look up for around here. But yeah, so there, there's plenty of room in Event Horizon Telescope related physics for people to look for physics that happens with rapidly changing uh, gravitational fields around black holes. Thanks so much for your questions, Elon. And also, I'm not a phenomenologist, so uh, I uh, appreciate your optimism in, in <laughs> what I know about uh, all the different particles. Uh, and the next question is, uh, again, from Jeffrey Tate. Um, are studies being conducted on plasma wave propagation in the accretion disk that might provide insight into black hole dynamics? Yeah, so we can't really take chunks of the accretion disk itself and put them in labs. Uh, but we can make simulations that do have uh, the waves we traditionally associate with astrophysical plasmas. So there are so-called uh, magnetosonic waves that are either fast or slow. There may be alpha vein waves. There are also plasma instabilities. Uh, so disks may be Parker unstable. They may have uh, magnetorotational instability. So these things are... are uh, um, part and parcel of the disk physics that we could uh, that we could simulate. But there are severe limitations based on uh, computational expense. So the objects that we're looking at are really big. So these galaxies, so even the width of this hole behind me can fit the entire orbit of Pluto times a few. So 
you know, it, it, we can only cover these in simulations by, you know, a one pixel or so covering this extent to really give us a sense about the fluid in the galaxy. So doing that, uh, you know, level of, uh, of analysis has a lot of subgrid physics that we can't possibly tell you what scales the, the small scale turbulence is, is uh, cascading into. So, uh, we, you know, we have our limitations. But uh, we you know, but there are also interesting things that the simulations are, uh, you know, adept at that finding. So, in, you know, I mentioned some of the disk instabilities. So the jets also have pinch and kink instabilities, and uh, those you can actually see in action. And you know, it's it's a miracle that relativistic jets, given you know, given how hard it is to collimate a plasma, like the fact that these jets collimate is is, is something that. Uh, you know, it took people like Roger Glantz from my advisor to understand how relative jets can be stable. The simulations really helped later on in, in furthering these uh, intuitions. All right, and a uh, final question uh, from Stefan uh, is, do we completely understand these jets? Oh, well, I mean, I, what, like, do we completely understand <laughs> anything? <laughs> um, I, uh, no, jets. So some of the mysteries in jets are really basic ones, like the content of these jets. So this is why I added positrons into these pipelines. So it's very customary in the field that I work in to not even include the effects of positrons. So we are at a state in the um, study of uh, relativistic jets where we don't know if these plasmas have 20 times more uh, positrons than protons in the jet or, uh, you know, 20 times more uh, protons than positrons. And, you know, that, that's a tremendous state of uncertainty. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, but there are tons of mysteries about jets. Uh, some things we, we do understand, but there's a lot more, uh, you know, that we don't. Thank you so much, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Well, if if there are no more questions, I want to thank everyone for coming on this lovely Friday afternoon. Um, thank you, Richard, for, mm -hmm. for putting this talk together. Thank you, Farah, for helping, uh, helping us organize. Um, and thank you, thank you as much as I can thank someone, Lisa, uh, for all of the organization on KITP's end.